Friday. So today we're going to uh, continue our discussion of arrays and loops, which we started last time. And we will reach a topic today that is one of the core conceptual concerns of computer science. So, you know, our goal over the first week and a half is to spin you guys up quickly, bring you to the point where you can actually write some simple programs. Um, and then we're just going to do a lot of that. We're going to get a little harder, a little harder, uh, gradually, you know. Um, but we're kind of at the point now where we can actually start to delve into the world of algorithms, right? And algorithms are, again, the core conceptual com concern of computer science. So we have these beautiful machines uh, that are now starting to become at your disposal, right? When you learn how to program, when you learn how to think about problems like a computer scientist, you become capable of taking these incredible machines, right? Really nothing, we've never created anything like this as a civilization, right? This will be, you know, again, I, maybe I'm, I'm taking a longer view than usual of history because I'm sitting in this anthropology class before ours, but when, you know, um, when the aliens show up and take over our planet, or at some point in the future when historians study this time on Earth, computers and the internet are going to be things that are going to be discussed because this has just really transformed our society in ways that are really important. And you guys are now starting on the verge of becoming a part of this. And really that's, you know, there's, there's two parts to that. One is knowing how to do things as a computer scientist, and that's the programming part of this class. But the other part is learning how to think about problems like a computer scientist. And that's the algorithmic, more conceptual part of the class. And we'll dip our toe into the waters of that topic today. All right, so just a little review from last time. Remember that we've expanded our ability to work with data in Java in a pretty dramatic way. So we started off being able to manipulate single data values. Now we're actually able to work with um, one or more of the same kind of value uh, put in order. So, and sequences of values or series of values, which is somehow how, sometimes how you think of them, really is actually pretty useful, right? This is a, a pretty powerful expansion of our way to work with data. It's not complete yet. Well, when we come back and we talk about objects later, we're going to talk about ways that we can mix and match different kinds of data in order to represent things in the real world. But even just being able to work with a single stream of the same kind of data is pretty important. Right? And this is our first example of a data structure. Arrays put items in order. right? And so they take this unordered information Really, we're going to do that today. And they put it in order, right? And so once I place items in an array, what I've really done is I've associated a new piece of information with them, their position in the array. So every item in an array not only has its value, but also an index. That index is something that we sometimes refer to as metadata. It's, you know, the embodiment of the structure that this particular data structure brings to data. We looked at ways to declare arrays in Java using this new um, bracket syntax. So a pair of brackets, open and close, tells Java that this variable multiple is not going to store one integer, it's going to store many. And I'm going to be able to index it using the bracket notation um, that doesn't have any contents right now because I've just declared it, but this is how we declare arrays. And we also looked at ways to both declare and initialize empty arrays. So this is my syntax for creating a new empty array of integers, and the value here is not one of the members of the array, it's the size. So this creates an array of size eight, and sort eight integers. That array um, I can access in the variable multiple. All right? I can also initialize arrays when I declare them, the same way I did with values. So when we talk about single values, we could have something on the right side of a declaration that was an initial assignment. In an array, I can do the same thing. The way I do this, again, the syntax is a little strange. Not sure why they didn't choose to use square brackets here instead of curly uh, braces, but this is, what, this is how Java works. So this is declaring and initializing an array called multiple, stores four values, one, two, five, and 10, where the indices associated with those are zero, one, two, and three. So I've taken those four values and I've put them in order. Zero indexing. So again, when we talk about the indexes in an array, the first value is index zero. The second value is index one. The 82nd value is index 81. You start counting at zero, 
This is how we do things in computer science, okay? That also means that the last value in the array is its length minus one. That's the last valid index. So the last va value in an array is uh, you can get or set it if the array was named A as A brackets. That's how I get or set one of the values of A. A dot length minus one. All right, so we did some examples with this. Now, I, I, one of the things I wanted to point out last time, just, just to really drive this home, because I think this, I, I don't want this point to be lost on anybody, right? So, so again, I have a, what I'm doing on line one is I'm declaring an array of integers called twos, and I'm sticking three values in it initially. And then I'm gonna print off, I'm gonna modify one of them, I'm gonna print off some of them to show you how to both uh, get and set items in the array by index. But here's the thing, okay? Remember, I said that arrays bring structure to data. So the data in this array is just the values one, two, and four, right? Three values. But even given those same values, the, the structure of the array matters. So if I put them in a different order, I really now have different data, right? It's the same values, just in a different order. So again, if I put them in a different order, I have different data, right? And so, Order matters in an array, and order is the metadata that an array is bringing onto our data, right? You know, again, you can't do an analysis of temperature measurements over time if you don't know what time they were taken, and you're just putting them in a random order, right? That's not helpful, it's not useful. Music doesn't sound good if you just play all the samples in the song in a random order. It sounds like static. Okay, so common mistake, something you guys are gonna make over and over again, walking off the end of an array. And we'll do this a few times together later just to see how this looks, right? So the problem with this uh, little chunk of code is that four is not a valid index for this array. This array has size four, valid indices are zero, one, two, and three. You will see this error, and this is one of those errors that's really easy to fix, right? Um, you guys will see this when you start working on the MP, which we're gonna, we're gonna release on Monday. You'll see it on some of the homework problems. You know, one of the, so may, maybe not to, uh, you know, to come back to this, although I think it's something that we should talk about a lot. Um, failure is a big part of what you guys are doing, right? So how many people here have gotten one of the homework problems wrong? Once. Oh, come on, just put your hand up, right? I know you all have, right? Even the ones of you that know how to do this, right? It's just like, oops, forgot the semicolon, oops, whatever. Like, it's okay. I do that all the time, right? Um, one of the tricks to getting good at this and a feeling good at it is to be able to quickly fix your mistakes. So when you see something like this in your code, I know it's scary, it's got all this junk, right? Look at all this stuff that's down here, right? <laughs> it's even, this is even scarier than when you guys see it in your code because it's got a stack trace that goes back into the little tool that we use to run your code during lecture, right? Okay, so, but here's the thing. There is information in here that you can use to fix the problem. And the quicker you can process one of these nasty error messages, the better things are gonna be for you. You're gonna get to, you know, so let me ask a different question. How many people have uh, made a mistake in the CBTF on one of the programming problems? Raise your hand, okay. Right, now here's the, here's the thing. If you can fix that mistake, you're done. We don't take points off for mistakes because that's how you learn how to do this. But if you're sitting there and you see this in the CBTF and you start to freak out because it's got all sorts of characters on the screen, stuff like that, and then 10 minutes go by and you can't solve it, then you're eating into time that you could be using to work on other things. So we look at this error message and you guys are gonna get better at this, I promise, but we're gonna, you're gonna get a lot of practice because you're gonna see a lot of these. Um, what is it telling us? So one of the most important pieces of information in any error message is the line number. It will tell me where the problem happened, right? Um, now, you know, here, this turns out to be wrong. Normally, these line numbers will be correct, right? Um, it's saying index four out of bounds. Actually, this is on our list of things to fix about this tool. We'll get there. Um, index four out of bounds for length four. But normally, this is gonna lead you directly to the line of code that's the problem. And so what it would say is, this is at line two. So I look, I get to line two, and then I look at the error message. So the first thing you do is locate the problem. It'll tell you exactly where the problem is. Then I jump into my code and I start looking at that line very carefully and then I use this piece of information it's giving me, index four out of bounds. So look at this and here, you know, the answer is obvious, right? But in the future, you know, it may not be, you may need to think about a little bit, how did I get to this point? 
right? Why did my code end up using an indice for this array that's invalid, or whatever the other problem is, okay? But again, you know, this is something, trust me, like, I see lots of these type of messages all the time, and it's just a question of being comfortable with them, you know, like, okay, it's fine, I got this, right? I know, what, and actually, well, you guys will, you know, some of you are probably a little bit freaked out by stuff of this right now, but, tr but trust me, at the end of the semester, when you see something like this, you'll be relieved, you'll be like, oh, phew, it's an easy one, right? Like, I can do array index out of bounds exceptions all day. I know how to fix this. All right. So here's an interesting, uh, somebody brought this up last time. And we will get to, so if you've worked in Python before with lists, you know you can do things like add items to the end, add items to the middle. You can do operations on lists in Python that change the length. In Java, with arrays, you cannot. Once you tell Java how many items in the, are in the array, um, that's the size the array is always going to be. It's never going to change size later. Now, if you want a bigger array, you can create a bigger array, and you can copy all the values from the first array into the second array, but you can't modify uh, the, val the size of the array without doing that. And that's kind of a clumsy thing to have to do, okay? So this turns out to have some interesting implications for our programs. We need to think about this, right? Um, it also has some interesting implications for the world around us. So how many people have the number two at the end of your net ID? Okay, any threes? Yeah, see, we're getting into the threes. Four? Who thinks they have like the largest number here? Shout it out. No way, no. I've seen double digits. Who's got like a 40 something? Yeah, see? 68. Anyone beat 68? Going once, what? 79. 79. 10, 10? Really? Wow. All right, well I think 10, 10's gonna take it, right? Um, why? Have you guys ever thought about this? Why can't they just give you first name dot last name at illinois.edu? Why is that so complicated? Wh why? So I'm, I'm asking this question now because I just gave you an important piece of information for answering it. This isn't just like random computer trivia day, although that would be a fun thing to do on Friday. Um, why? Who, who can, given what I just told you, and remember, Java's an old language, other languages that were used around this time had similar limitations. What is, so if, if, if we went through this entire room and I asked everybody their net ID, there would be something that would be true about all of them, okay? Yeah. Well, they're not necessarily all eight characters. Who has one that's not eight characters? How long is yours? Four. Okay, but does anyone have one that's nine? Ten? They're at most eight characters. So the longest net ID that we can hand out on this campus is eight characters. And so we've got these terrible, so, so the reason that we're into the twos and maybe I'll, I'll be here long enough to live into the, like, the era of the fives and the eights. I really actually like the number eight, so maybe I'll stick around to see like, when everybody here's like, I've got eight, right? That means that if you're a two, that means that there's someone without that two out there on campus, okay? And you maybe wanna find that person and make friends with them, right? And see if you can get them to leave <laughs> so you can take their net ID, um, right? So, but this is why, right? And so actually, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't want you to think like this is what, when you grow up to be a grown-up computer scientist, here's the type of real-world programs you can write. There is a program that the IT staff here has to maintain, and it takes as input your name, and it spits out as output a net ID, okay? And it's gotta go through all these terrible permutations of letters and, I mean, it tries to get you something. It just doesn't give you like a random number, right? But some of the net IDs you guys have are probably pretty torturous, right? If you guys want, you can start a, thread on the forum later and you can compete to see who has the worst net ID. Um, I've seen some pretty, pretty terrible ones and some that turned out, I know they've got, so here's the thing, I know they have checks for certain swear words and stuff like that, right? So and they're not gonna hand out like F-U-C-K-5, right? Like that one's not, no one's gonna have that net ID, right? But they have inadvertently handed out ones that sound like that or whatever. So, so there's some, yeah, there's some people that have been like, can I not have, Anyway, I won't, <laughs> I won't pour you to the, I, I can't say them in class anyway. Um, this is why, right? This is why 
this is a leftover limitation of older computer systems that can only store a certain amount of information, right? So at some point when someone decided that, you know, oh, well, all the identifiers on the system are gonna be at most eight characters, now it's like 50 years later and we're still living with this. It's sort of incredible, right? All right, Java has other data structures for working with sequential data that we'll talk about later, right? So if you're thinking like, oh my gosh, this is terrible, I'm never gonna use this language, uh, it does have something that's like a list, right? We talked about arrays first because they're a little simple. All right, so like we talked about last time, we frequently use loops to walk through arrays and process the data that's inside of it. Okay, and we looked at a couple of uh, canonical uh, different looping constructs. So this is, you know, again, probably the most common for loop you will ever write. It goes through every item in a, an array or anything that has a length, really. This one goes through an array. It starts at zero, it continues while the index is less than the length, okay? Remember, the, the index that is the length is an invalid index, so the last valid one is one before it, and every time it increments it by one. This is our three-part for loop, right? Um, now, I wanna briefly talk about a couple things that you can do inside a loop to control how the loop executes. So without these statements, a loop will continue to run until, um, until it reaches, um, until the, the condition is no longer true, right? But we have two ways in Java to um, adjust this process, right? These are Java keywords. This is an instruction in the language that will cause your loop to behave differently, okay? So, and the, and the two have different use cases. Right? So the first one is something called break. Break breaks out of the loop. As soon as you get a break statement, the loop stops, and I drop below the loop, and your program keeps running. Okay, so it exits the loop immediately, continues uh, running. Continue is a little bit different. So continue will simply jump back to the top of the loop before you reach the bottom. So if you get to a continue statement in your loop, none of the code below the loop, below that statement is going to run. But I'm gonna jump back to the top of the loop and keep going. Right? So maybe, you know, so, and, and these are useful when I'm thinking about data and how to process data using a loop. So imagine that I'm looking through an array for a particular value, right? As soon as I find it, I don't care about the rest of the values in the array, so I break out of the array. Or alternatively, imagine that I'm looking for, I'm, I'm doing like, I need to email all the students on campus, and this is, this is probably true, this, there's probably code like this somewhere out there, I need to email all the students on campus that have like, you know, that are sophomores. So I get a list of all the information about all the students, I go through it one by one. If the student's not a sophomore, I just keep going, I continue, jump back to the top of the loop. If the student is a sophomore, I send them an email and say something nice, or not nice. All right, so let's look at these. Um, so here's an example of break, right? And let's put, well, this is gonna print a lot. Right, oh, okay, well actually it's not gonna print that much. So let's think about how this works. So this is my canonical for loop. Well, this is not the canonical for loop, it's a for loop with a bound. So I'm starting at zero, I'm continuing my i is less than 64. And remember the code, this is something we haven't actually quite seen yet, right, but the, the statements inside my for loop can be code, just like all the other code we've been writing. So I can put an if statement in there. My if statement says if the index I that I've declared inside my for loop is equal to this value I'm looking for, then I should break. Otherwise, I don't enter the if statement. So let's think about what happens as this loop executes. So the first time through, what's the value of search? Eight, what's the value of I? Is zero equal to eight? So I go down here and I print not found. That's this line. What do I do next? Go back to the top of the loop. Update i. Check whether i is still less than 64. Is one less than 64? Yeah, so I keep going. Is one equal to eight? No, print this again. And I continue this process. In fact, if I wanna see exactly what's happening here, let's put, um, let's change this print statement to print off the value of i. We'll talk about why this works next week when we talk about strings. 
So now what I'm displaying each time is the current value of i. So I go through, I go through. If i equals search, then I break, and then let me put a print statement here so you can see that this code does, in fact, leave the loop once it's finished. There you go. Done. All right, so this is the use of break. Questions about this? It's a good chance to take any questions about loops, um, about break, anything like that, yeah. Mm. Great question. So the, so the question is, if I have a nested loop, and we'll see these, um, and, and, and ask me about this when I get there. Um, so we'll see cases where I actually want a loop inside my loop. So every time I go through the loop, I go through another loop. I can have a loop inside my loop inside my loop, right? I, you know, as you start to, as you start to talk about loops inside loops inside loops inside loops, the use cases start to drop, but loops inside loops is pretty common. Um, the break statement jumps out of the closest loop. So the break statement will not leave all of the loops. It will only leave the, uh, the closest and closing loop. There is a way to get it to jump all the way back. I don't talk about that in this class. It's sort of an advanced Java feature. If you want to know how to do it, ask on the form. And, and we'll give you a piece of code that, that does it. Great question. Okay. Other questions? So let's change this to a continue and see what happens. Okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, if I didn't find the value, then I'm going to continue. Otherwise, I'm going to say found. All right? So now let's think about how this code works. Same loop, but instead of breaking, I'm continuing. So what happens here? So I go through the loop. If i is not the value I'm looking for, all right, so again, this is kind of the typical use of continue. Like, I don't want to bother with the rest of the loop if I'm the, the value that I'm that I have doesn't meet some criteria. So now the question is, is i equal to eight? If i is not, I continue. And you'll see here that this found statement is not executed. It's not executed the first time I go through the loop when i is zero, the second time when i is one, the third time when i is two, the fourth time when i is three, until i is eight, because then I don't enter that if statement, right? And then I print found, okay? Now the loop keeps going, actually, right? Um, so this loop actually will execute 64 times. There's no break in there, right? Um, if I wanted to break out of the loop, I could actually put a break statement down at the bottom, but that's kind of weird. I'm not going to do that. Um, all right, questions about this loop? What, what do I want to print? Ah, okay. Well, so essentially, this is, the, the else statement is already, so this, is equi this is equivalent, right? Because I'm not reaching the bottom of that block of code unless i is not equal to, i is equal to search, right? So these two pieces of code are the same, and they're going to execute, yeah. Contains tab characters. I don't believe that checksum. There you go. Yeah, so this, this will perform the same way, right? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, okay, so let's, 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 that's a great question. So the question is, can you give me, because these two were kind of contrived. So let's, let's try to come up with a better uh, example of the use of continue. So I'm going to load up an array here with some random numbers. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if i is less, and let me put these in, let me put these in some sort of arbitrary order, right, not just descending. Okay, so I've got some, so if i is less than 10, I'm going to continue. Otherwise, I'll say, I'll print i. Oh, sorry. So I've got to do if values. So I want to go through values. So I'm modifying this to go through my array. I'm going to go value by value. And I also need to change this. Okay. 
There you go. So continue, so there's no break statement here, right? So continue is useful in the case where I want to filter the list somehow, right? Does that make sense? So rather than like stopping when I get to a particular point, in this case I have a condition. This is sort of like what I was talking about before, where I could check like if you're a sophomore or something, right? So I have a condition that has to be met. The condition is that the value has to be greater than 10, greater than or equal 10. If it's not, I just go back to the top of it, right? Look, there, there are people that usually, if you're using break and continue, um, break, on one hand, is actually pretty useful when I know that I won't want to keep executing a loop. Continue, on the other hand, I can usually rewrite a continue statement using an if-else statement, right? And so, for example, I could write this. So here's one way to write this piece of code. Another way is like this. Same thing. Now, people will, people will differ about which one of these they consider to be uh, syntactically more clear. To me, it depends on the amount of code that's in the loop. If there's a lot of code in the loop, putting it all inside an if statement is sort of annoying, right? So what you do is you check at the top, you continue, and then you do a bunch of things at the bottom, right? Um, if it's a small piece of code like this, it's usually clear to just put what you want to happen for certain values inside an if statement. Questions about this before we go on? All right, good. All right, so break. You know, we did break and continue, okay. So the, the idea of going through values one at a time in an array is so common in Java that there's actually a little bit of a nicer way to do this, right? So again, this is my very, very canonical for loop when I'm processing data in an array. I wanna go one item at a time from the beginning of the array to the end. Instead, here's another way to do this. Now again, this is another piece of syntax for you to, 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 to remember and think about. Um, here, I've created an array of integers that stores the first six prime numbers. And here's what this loop does. One at a time, from the beginning to the end, it takes values out of that array and stores them in the value prime that I can then use inside the loop. So again, if I really want to go through arrays one at a time, from beginning to end, I can use this enhanced loop. Now, here's the thing. You'll notice here that now there's, there, there's a trade-off, right? The nice thing about the enhanced loop is you see at the top I have to use the bracket notation to get the value of the array. So I can't just print prime, I have to print primes bracket i. That's how I get the, current, the value of the array that I'm working with. Down here, I don't have to use the bracket notation. Java will will one at a time set the value of prime to be the next value in the array as I go through. The disadvantage is I don't have access to the index. So up here, I know both what the value is that I'm working with, which is primes bracket i, I also know i, the index in the array. So I get both pieces of information. Then there's times when you actually really need to know the index for the processing that you're doing. It's important, right? Like maybe I want to sum all of the every other value in the array. So the first, the third, the fifth, you know, if I do that, I need to know i, right? If I want to sum all the values in the array, I don't care, and I can do it using this uh, simpler form. All right, let me pause for questions. Since I know that, you know, we've, we've pushed a lot of new concepts at you guys over the past couple days. Yeah. Great question. Yes, I, sh I should have mentioned this and I forgot. In both loops, the scope of the variable that's declared in the loop, so here the variable's name is i, here it's prime, is inside the loop block. So I can't access it after the loop ends. Yeah, absolutely. And this can be awkward in certain cases. Like, so for example, if you want to go through an array and figure out what the first index where a particular value appears, I can show you how to do that, but you can't use the index variable that's declared inside the loop because once the loop exits, you don't have access to its value anymore. Yeah, good question. All right, let me uh, provide some encouragement since, you know, we're, we're halfway through class. So, you know, we, we always sort of keep track of this, right? Um, and this, this number bounces around from semester to semester, right? Um, and, and this was actually yesterday before everybody finished it, right? So you guys are doing fine. You're like, oh no, I see a downward trend, right? Yeah. Just, just don't come back and take it in like 2030, right? Because I'll be like, uh-oh, right? 
no, you guys are fine, right? Uh, I, I, like, I've, I've been looking at, you know, the, the grades on the website, and it's like one big bar centered around 45, which, by the way, is the maximum number of points you can get right now. Like, I think that maybe that makes more sense to people. In the past, people have been like, oh my gosh, I'm failing the class, I only have 45. It's like, well, there's no way to get those other 55 points yet, so you're, you're cool. All right, so now let's have some fun with, let, you know, I, I'm gonna put these up. Maybe we'll do one or two of them. Maybe I'll do one now, I'll get through the rest of the material, and we'll come back, and we can finish as many as we have time for. Um, but we're gonna give you some homework problems like this, and it's just, these are just chances to write loops that work with data stored in an array. So here, I want you to print every member, every character inside this loop. So, if you guys work on this on your own, you can watch me do it if you want. Um, one way to do it is to use my standard for loop. I want to start my index at zero. I can keep using the index as long as it's less than the length of the array. And I'm going to increment it by one every time. And then I'm just going to use my good old system.out.println to print that value. And that'll work. Can I write this in a different way? I can. So if I wanted to use the enhanced for loop, I could do this, I could say care uh, value from to print, and now I'm gonna print just that value, also works. You might, again, have a preference for this one, it's a little bit more clear. All right, um, we have a couple of these, so uh, has anyone figured out how to uh, print things on the same line in Java? So when I use system.out.println, it prints whatever I give it, and then it also takes me to a new line. If I want to print things on the same line, what we'll do, again, it's just a chance to write our, our same loop, get these looping constructs in our fingers so that they, we start to get some muscle memory here. So if I just use a print statement, not print line, it will not print a new line. But when I'm done, I'm gonna wanna print just an empty one. There it is. So now they've been printed one after another, and then when I'm done, I, I advance to a new line just using an empty print one statement. Okay, let me see where I am as far as, okay. So let me jump ahead and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about algorithms toward the end of class, and then if we have time, we'll go back and we can finish some of those examples at the end. All right. So here's where we are. Right? We are essentially, in, in, in four classes, we have introduced you to the ways in Java that you can access the core special computer capabilities. These are the things computers are good at that you're not good at, and now you know how to get computers to do them for you. Right? But with these basic building blocks still leaves a very big question to answer, which is that how do I solve a problem? How do I actually get the computer to do something useful, right? You know, printing off values from an array, that can sometimes be useful, right? But usually we're interested in having computers do slightly more sophisticated tasks. What we're gonna do a lot throughout the rest of the semester is we're gonna ask you to implement an algorithm. And I wanna be very clear about what an algorithm is and what an algorithm is not, okay? An algorithm is a set of steps that I use to solve a problem. You guys may not realize it, but you all implement algorithms all the time without touching a computer. You have ways that you solve problems in the world around you. Like when something is wrong with your car or whatever, there's a series of steps that you go through. That's an algorithm, right? You know, when you need to make coffee, there's a series of steps that you go through. That's an algorithm, right? The algorithms we're interested in, of course, is are ones that we can have a computer implement, all right? And in order to do that, we're gonna have to be very precise about what we tell the computer to do. That's actually probably the biggest source of frustration for the next couple months. People will come to me and they'll say, you know, I knew how to solve the problem, but I couldn't write it down in code. And that's because you guys are just getting started with this and you will get better at it, right? Um, the way that we get computers to solve a problem for us we have them do a combination of the following things. Perform simple calculations, store the results, make simple decisions, and repeat a series of steps. 
and of course as fast as possible, because why not, right? These are the things you now know how to get computers to do. So the word algorithm, again, algorithm is a general idea. A piece of Java code is not an algorithm. An algorithm is an idea. An algorithm exists outside of how we implement it. You can take the same algorithm and implement it in Python, in Java, in Kotlin, in Go, in C, in Haskell, whatever. In fact, there's a whole website. Uh, has anyone ever been to rosettacode.com before? So if you guys go there, I can send out a link on the forum. It actually has, for specific algorithms, implementations in like every single language that they know of. Some of them have hundreds of different implementations in every language you've heard of, and then all the languages you've never heard of, and some that I've never heard of, and some that I'm not even sure are real. Um, they've just got the same problem solved in these different languages, um, the same algorithm, the same series of steps for solving the problem implemented differently. So we distinguish between an algorithm and an implementation. An algorithm is the problem-solving approach. An implementation is the Java code that you had to write to get Java to carry out those series of steps. It's different than what you would write in Python, even if the algorithm is the same. So I, I, I you know, one of, the, one of the coolest things I think that's happening right now is, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're so getting so much better at processing text with computers. And so we can see these really cool things going on in the world. So this is, um, this is word usage over time, and I think this was calculated by the Google Books Project. So Google has digitized a lot of books out of the world's libraries. Maybe you think that that was an okay thing for them to do. Maybe you don't, but they did it. Um, and what, what, the, what they found is that this is the use of the word algorithm, right? And you can see, when does it start taking off? 1950s, 1960s, right? That's when we start, first computers are being built. So this is a word that even though it describes a general purpose set of steps, is heavily associated with the technology that you guys are learning how to use. So over the next couple of weeks, the most fun way to exercise these new skills that you guys are building is by implementing algorithms. So that's, that's what we're gonna do a lot, right? In class um, and on your homework problems. You guys are gonna have practice, we're gonna say, solve this problem, and we're gonna ask you to do it in code. The problems we're gonna ask you to solve, not particularly complicated. But again, even if you know how to solve it, writing the code and getting the code to work is not always straightforward. All right, so let's think about, you know, a simple algorithm based on a homework problem you guys have already done, right? If I can get the slide deck to work, right? Whenever we start solving these problems, I really encourage you to do the following thing. And this is true whether or not you're solving part of the MP, you're solving a homework problem, whatever. Think about what you're trying to do first. Don't start writing code immediately. You don't have to write it down on a piece of paper. Who writes stuff on paper anymore? That's, that's, like, that's a weird thing to do. Um, write it in a comment in your code, right? So write, first I'm going to do X, and then another comment, then I'm going to do Y. And this is actually really helpful for your CAs when you start coming to office hours for questions, because they can look at your code and say, oh, I see what you're trying to do, and let me help you do that. Right, because in many ways there's a lot of, in many cases there's a lot of ways to solve these problems. All right, so I have three integers, and I want to find a way to find their maximum value. Now there's a, there's, there's a variety of ways to do this, right? Um, but here's the algorithm that I'm gonna propose that we try to implement. So let's say they're called A, B, and, or first, second, and third, okay? One of the ways to tackle this problem is to try to make it a little smaller. So if I have three integers that I'm trying to figure out which is the maximum, if I compare two of them, well, so let's say I compare the first one and the second one. At that point, do I know what the maximum value is? If I have three numbers and I only compare the first two. Like, let's say you have three numbers on pieces of paper, and you give me two of them. Can I tell which one is the maximum out of the three? No, because you still got another one, I don't even know what it is yet. But what do I know? There's something I can tell right away. What is that? I don't know which one is the maximum yet, but what do I know? I, I've, I can obtain more information that will allow me to continue solving the problem. What can I do? Yeah. Bingo. I know that one of them is not the maximum. Now, if they're equal, it could be either. So basically, if I look at the first two, 
The one that's smaller is not the maximum, because to be the maximum, it has to be the largest of all three. It's not. If the two are the same, then either, and then I can essentially discard one of them, because I'm not losing any information. So I say, okay, if you gave me two twos, two might be the maximum or not be the maximum, but I can, I still know, you know, I've still crossed one of these numbers off my list. Now, you give me the next number, okay? And so now, I know, so essentially the first step is, I look at two and I cross one off the list, now you give me the third one, now I've still only got two numbers. I have the maximum of the first two and the new one you gave me. And so now, whichever one of those two is bigger is the maximum. So let's write this down in code. I'm gonna use first and, uh, so I'm gonna say int maximum is, and I'll just set it to first to start. And then I'll say if second is greater than first, maximum is equal to second. All right, so now I've only dealt with first and second. But at this point, maximum is gonna be the greater of the two of them. If they're the same, then it's, then it doesn't matter. Right? It's, it's the value that they both share. Now I'm gonna say, if third is greater than maximum, maximum is equal to third. That's it, I'm done. So now let's print the maximum and see if we actually did the right thing, okay? So it looks correct. Let's test it, so, and we'll talk about testing more in a little bit, but whenever you're testing your code, you wanna test different ways in which it could be wrong. So let's make sure that it does the right thing if the maximum is the first value. Looks like it does. What about if the maximum is the last value? Looks like it does. What if the first two values are the same and they're the maximum? Also works. What if the last two values are the same and they're also the maximum? Also works. What if they're all the same? Also works. Okay, so that's just a little small example of the process, right? But write it down, even if this one is just two steps. Write down what you're trying to do before you start converting it into code. And then you go bit by bit, taking those pieces of intention, right? This is my intention for this piece of code, and trying to convert it into actual Java code, right? All right, any questions at this point? I have a few important announcements I wanna make today. I've reserved a little bit of time at the end of class, but we do have a few time, a few minutes for any questions or concerns people have. Oh, people have asked about the reading assignment. So if you go to the course calendar, what I'm doing is on each quiz, the topic is marked and the chapter of coders that you need to read. All right, so next week it's chapter two. It's one chapter at a time for a while. There are no questions about the book on the midterms, so we skip a few weeks here and there, but I will keep the calendar up to date. If it's not up to date, let me know and I'll fix it. But usually I'll be doing that on Sunday. So this Sunday I'll add the chapter you need to read for quiz three, which is not next week, but the week after. All right, so let's talk about MP0. So MP0 is, we're gonna release on Monday. Probably right after class. So this sort of marks the uh, beginning. And it's actually kind of neat this semester that all of the first set of your homework problems are due on Sunday. And then on Monday, we give you the first part of the MP to work on. So this is a transition in the class in terms of our approach. Up until this point, we've been having you solve these small problems, and we've been making sure that you can do it by testing you in the CBTF. And that's a certain type of ability that you need to succeed as a computer scientist, okay? The MP is a completely different type of ability that you need to succeed as a computer scientist. And so some of you, even ones that have been doing really well in the homework and have been feeling really comfortable, are gonna sit down with that on Monday and your brain is just gonna explode, okay? Ben told me, and, and you know, I'm sharing this with you because I love you guys and I care about you and I don't want you to do this, okay? So Ben told me that one of his friends, so Ben's a pretty smart guy. One of his friends signed up for this class. He, as soon as he got a hold of the MP, he opened it up, looked at how much there was, was in there and dropped the class like immediate, don't do that, okay? We are going to help you. It is intimidating, I'm not gonna lie. There's everything you need in there to build a simple Android application. We've given you a lot to start with, okay? But don't do that, like we will help you, all right? But I don't want you to think that this type of experience, that the 
feelings of bewilderment and confusion and frustration that go along with this are something that we are not aware of and that is not part of our plan, okay? This is something that you will have to learn. Learn it now, learn it later, but you're gonna be tossed into a big project and given a lot of information all at once at some point, and you're just gonna have to sort it out one piece at a time. We're gonna help you, we're gonna train you how to do this, but this is part of the learning experience that goes along with this class. It's very orthogonal to the homework problems. The homework problems are these really neat, tidy pieces of code to write. The MP is this big, sprawling mass, and in order to succeed, you're gonna have to kinda like put your blinders on and ignore a lot of it, right? Because the amount of code you actually have to write is not that big, and it's not that complicated. It's probably easier than a lot of the homework problems. But you're gonna spend a lot of time figuring out what to do and finding how to make your changes and figuring out how to find out how they work, right? So it's a lot of sort of fumbling around. That does not mean you are bad at this. That does not mean you're not gonna do well. It is normal, okay? All right, um, next week, so we've also been spending this whole week training the CAs, which is really exciting. And uh, Rima and the other captains have run a fantastic training program. Next week, we start lab uh, office hours full throttle. So 12 to 8, Monday, Wednesday, sorry, 12 to 8, Monday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And those are the hours we'll be running for the rest of the semester, okay? We will also get you started on MP0 a little bit in lab. And so again, I just wanna make sure you understand this. We're throwing you in the deep end a little bit. You know, it is intentional. It's not that deep. And there's like 100 lifeguards, right? Like the, the deep end is so crowded with core staff that you know it's hard for us to even toss you in there. Right? We had to find an empty spot. Um, all right. I want to talk about something else, right? So we, we we did this last time, and actually people seemed okay with it. Maybe my luck will run out this semester. Um, but here's how we're going to do deadlines for the MP. I just wanted to talk about this in class for a couple of minutes, um, and we can talk about it on the forum, and you guys can complain about it on Reddit or whatever. I, I'm cool with that. Um, but let me at least. Uh, explain why we're doing this. So half of you will have your MP checkpoints due on Sundays. Those are people that have labs before 4 p.m. Okay, so if your lab is before 4 p.m., the deadlines for all of your MP checkpoints will be on Sunday. The rest of you, if your labs start at 4 p.m. or later, I think this is the cutoff. We will inform you what it is. Um, you guys will have deadlines on Monday. This is why we did this, okay? Um, so, oops, <laughs> it's like, it's like about why. There's no reason why, we just thought it'd be fun. So every, everything we've done, everything we do to design this class is really with the intention of trying to get you guys as much help as possible. When everybody has to come into office hours on one day and try to get help at the last minute, it becomes a nightmare. By breaking you guys into two groups, we're allowing our core staff to be more effective. Right? So this is why we did this. Right, if you guys have questions or concerns about it, post on the forum. Otherwise, on Monday we will back and we'll be talk about functions, which is extremely exciting. We have office hours today from 12 to four. All of the first set of homework problems are due on Sunday. Sunday is also the deadline to fill out the survey that you can do to get 1% extra credit. I will see you guys on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend.